background is, uh, I suppose, a little bit unorthodox. I've been a career educator for a good 30 years now, but I'm also a qualified architect in two jurisdictions, uh, in the UK and also in Singapore, where I ran a practice for a number of years. Um, so a lot of this has come from, uh, I suppose, some kind of personal history involved with the development of, of what we call modern tropical architecture. Because there was a time, I think, when I was starting in architecture school where it, it, there wasn't actually very much conversation about this. Um, there wasn't very much information. Uh, and just not to put a fine point about it, but a lot of the books that you find today on, on tropical architecture written by people like Tan Hock Beng are contemporaries of mine. Who, we went to school together and you know, I contributed to quite a lot of those books. So we were at the cusp of that transformation. Uh, and part of the transformation was also got to do with the emergence of what people call the global south now, what at the time was called the third world. Um, there was a lot of defiance to not want to do a tropical architecture for various reasons, uh, largely uh, stemming from a kind of sociological stigma that the tropical form of architecture is a vernacular form, and it's not a modern form, and it's not you know, it doesn't bring you into that kind of modern sphere of the economy. And to, to, to a large extent, there was even an avoidance of uh, certain types of material that were associated with the, the tropical architecture. For example, timber was actually frowned upon. And not many people used timber because it, it, it was seen to be poor if you used timber and concrete was seen to be the modern material which explains what happens in the, what we call the global south now. You see a lot of concrete building and that is that kind of stigma really, really coming to, to bear fruit. Um, so I've been part of that kind of history and I'm going to talk also about uh, this from a slightly historical perspective. As I said, my background is a bit different. I'm, I'm also a very active architectural historian. Um, so if we look into the, the tropics, it's roughly in that kind of territory, south of the Tropic of Cancer, north of the Tropic of Capricorn, and it covers a whole sphere. And if we look at the world from how we understand it today, a lot of that is colonized territory. And truth be told, you know, modern architecture really traveled with the colonization process. And in so far as Britain was involved with this, um, the East India office were really, really very influential. They went as far as the West Indies, they went to India, they went everywhere. The great sort of colonizing ship, ship uh, or, or maritime uh, naval armies were the Dutch, the Portuguese, and of course the British. So one of the kind of strange things around the time, this is around 1815 to 1826, uh, if you were part of the East India Company, you would receive your training in Ediscombe. Um, and in Ediscombe, you would learn Hindustani, you would learn French, you would learn Latin, you would learn this and that, and you will also undertake beginning from about 1815, a course in architecture. And of course, the kind of training that they had was really quite different from what we have now. It's a book that's a handwritten book by, uh, by a fellow called uh, Charles Pasley. And it's, uh, it, it's coming from a very, uh, I suppose, European approach. They were taught how to put bricks together. And it was you know, very much a, a, a theoretical course, not, not much practical training not much design training. They were taught how to build fireplaces at length, you know, and then they were sent out to the West Indies where there's no use for fireplaces. And that's the kind of disjuncture that we're dealing with. So part of the issue of how tropical architecture emerged is that they, there are two amateur sources. One, the vernacular inhabitants who created a, a, a kind of native form of architecture. And two, um, the colonizing uh, forces that brought a Western architecture, but brought it not in a kind of professional manner. They brought these East India uh, officers who were also operating as architects. And, and these were the people who built all these buildings or designed all these buildings in a climate that they were never used to. Um, so here we see a really interesting rendering. This is a, a uh, uh, church called St. Andrews this is the first version of St. Andrews, uh, which burned down uh, in around 1853. The architect is actually uh, a trained architect, or at least an apprentice Irishman architect, 
he apprenticed as an architect in, in uh, Drogheda, and then he traveled to Kolkata at the age of 19, and then he applied his trade there. But at least he was trained in the profession. The rest of these guys who were involved with it were, were basically uh, amateurs or uh, East India office people, or, you know, for example, like John Turnbull Thompson, who was a surveyor, he was a land surveyor. Um, and he designed a spire to the church. Uh, Coleman didn't have a spire. Thompson designed the spire. But, you know, like many people of his time, he was a polymath. Thompson not only designed this, the spire, but he also painted this painting. This is watercolor by him. And he recorded much of the life around the time. And actually, what, much of what we know uh, is really due to the, the writings and the recordings of, of, of his uh, observations of life. Uh, if you like to know, Thompson actually retired and moved to south of New Zealand in Otago, and he's a very well-respected surveyor. And he, so he has two legacies, one in Singapore and one also in New Zealand. The next series of photos I'm going to show you is taken off the 1863 version of the church or the cathedral and at the top of the spire. So this just gives you an idea of what was happening around the time. This is a panoramic series of 10 photographs. showing you the landscape. This is the tallest thing around and it's just kind of basically had a, uh, a view of the whole of the development around the time. This is very, very early times. And you can see that these buildings are pretty much European with pitch, pitch roofs, but they all have verandas. And that's the one kind of, I suppose, distinguishing feature that was uh, uh, maybe a, a form of acclimatization uh, to the, to the uh, environment but very nondescript these are all kind of buildings done by uh, mostly amateurs and some images of the seafront yeah and the only kind of forms of, of cooling were, were by you know mechanically move fans or manually move fans and this is the, the where we get the word panka panka walla and these panka wallas were, were basically laborers who pull these fans um, via the system of cables, and we see a much more interesting photo here of how they were kind of doing it. Back in the day, they just lie on their back and just move their legs, you know, like what people would do today. Strange how times have changed. Today, you pay money to do these sorts of things. <laughs> anyway, so the development of tropical architecture really, you know, was something kind of accidental. Um, it was mostly through amateur efforts to try to design for the climates that they, they were in. Um, it was not until about the 1950s that we see the first sort of stirrings of a much more professionalized approach. Uh, there were various, various kinds of uh, edicts uh, from the British government, for example, for telling people how to dress when you go to Australia, how to dress when you go to the West Indies, or how you dress when you go to Malaysia, um, and you know, what kind of climate you would encounter. Architecturally, there was a very, very famous conference around 1953 on tropical architecture at the AA in London. And this is one where they started to talk about the appropriate forms of design in that particular climate. And that was fueled by some of the kind of scientific studies that culminated in, in the work of these three people, Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, uh, and then also Koenigsberger and his crew of people. These are the two most famous sources of tropical architectural thinking. And this is very kind of primitive early science approach to how architectural design can be applied in the tropics. Because this was much, you know, um, very raw information. And there wasn't very much of, of examples that were around. Um, and these were people I was intimately involved with. I worked with Tae Keng Soon and I worked with William Lim. Um, and I know Ken Yang. And they were, uh, Lim Chong Ket, the, the guy in the middle there, he, he was uh, a mentor to William Lim and Tae Keng Soon. And these were the people who were basically that kind of first generation of uh, architects who were advocates for a, a tropical form of architecture. And they were advocates for the use of materials in an in a, in a, in a ecologically appropriate way, you know, particularly using timber, uh, using natural forms of ventilation and so forth. Okay, um, so we come from that legacy of how these people have, you know, uh, probably 
steered the pathway. And then I'm going to talk about some of their work, but also about the work of the generation that I belong to, who studied with these people uh, and who or who work with them. Uh, so these are some very generic uh, climatic data of of of, of the, the tropics. Of course, it has very high rainfall. The temperature is uh, about 30 degrees on average, plus or minus four or five night and day, and so forth. This is really quite generic. But I'm going to talk about how the vernacular responses have attacked these conditions or dealt with them. These are the conditions in which these buildings exist. So these are the typical forms of, of vernacular housing that you would find all over Southeast Asia. And this is a typical Malay house which is built on stilts for a very good reason that you would get ventilation under the flooring and it would actually go through the floorboards. You get cross ventilation, you get a secondary roof and you get what is effectively a kind of jack roof. The heat goes up and it's a very cool building. At the same time, it deals with all the kinds of um, scientific uh, approaches that we have today, but in a very vernacular, very naturalistic uh, or organic way. So dealing with all these sorts of things that we, we are, are taking um, as considerations today, you know, humidity, temperature, radiation, air movement. And the strategies are actually quite simple because there are ways in which they will deflect the sun, ways in which they will move air, ways in which they will cool the air before it's moved uh, by passive cooling, by evaporative cooling and so forth. And by geometrical orientation to create stack movement, uh, to have cross ventilation. So a single cell uh, building is, is preferred. And also courtyards are preferred because you, you, you are able to ventilate through. But these are you know, simple strategies that deal with very simple forms of buildings. But once you get to a much more complex situation, which is what is going to be the main part of my talk today, with regards to how you deal with the modern tropical city, then it gets much, much, much more complex. You know, you have eddy currents forming, you have buildings relating to each other. And as much as we look at a simple diagram like, like this, and I'll show you some of the complications that, that actually occur uh, in various parts of the world about how this is not necessarily just the solution. The solution is much more about a uh, concerted environmental uh, strategy uh, that neighbors have to work together to be actually sustain a, a, a tropical architecture, otherwise it just completely doesn't work. So these are, you know, typical diagrams showing you, uh, these are from, from Koenigsberger, you know, and, and here we see Le Corbusier using a double roof material with, with a hollowed out interior so that it, it allows the cooling. These are some typical strategies of uh, walls and shading, bris soleil, basic approaches to how wind movement is understood. Again, these very simple singular cell orientations, uh, shading from the sun using mechanical devices like this, and ending up with works like this. Of course, it was not only just in, in Southeast Asia. We have some very primitive modern architecture that was uh, tropical, if you like, in Florida. And this is the work of uh, Paul Rudolph. He did several of these sorts of houses. Um, and if you remember his work, he was a great draftsman. That drawing on the top is, is actually from his hand. And these photographs are of, of the building in its current, current state. Basically, it's a building on stilts, like a Mesian, you know, steel building, steel frame building, but completely open on, on all sides with these flaps that when they flap up, they create a shade, and then they, they, they allow uh, the building to, to ventilate. And then you can see that mechanical ballast that holds that flap up in a particular position. But if we look at the plan, this is where I think it really gets problematic. It has no sense of orientation. It's actually basically a shed. And it's such a basic building, it's identical on all sides or symmetrical on all sides. And uh, the openings, the strategy is, is so simple, it's you know, repeated on four sides. And 
I don't believe that he actually had any kind of environmental strategy. It, it was a very simplistic sort of design. Uh, pretty though it might be, it really doesn't have any kind of sophisticated response to, to climate. Here we see a development by Ken Yang, and this is his personal house. This is the, the famous roof roof house in Ampang, uh, just out of KL, Kuala Lumpur. And basically it has two roofs. It's a very kind of Kabusian design, but it has two roofs. It's got this flat roof, and then it's got this curved uh, sun shading device which basically is, is an additional uh, um, entity. Ken Yang's approach largely is not just in, in shading, but also primarily in orientation. And if you look into how he develops his work into a, a much more complex uh, multi-story building, the, the stratagem is the same. It's fundamentally about orientation. It's about orientation because east and west matters because you get a buildup of heat in one direction, in the afternoon sun, in the morning sun, you don't get so much. Now, if you take the Paul Rudolph strategy and apply it here, it has no sense of orientation. It has no orientative response. Whereas in this one, we see a development and there is a slight sort of orientative response. I would say slight because this is very, very early on. This is around 1984. So here's a response that has, uh, 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 a way of dealing with, with, with the heat and also a way of dealing with, with, with natural ventilation. It has a very, very small air well, uh, a courtyard, if you like. Okay? And that has developed into the kind of modern day where you know, people of my generation are kind of dealing with this sort of thing in uh, much more modern designs. I'm showing you here work of, of a company called Woha. Woha, the architects are Wong Ban Sun and, and Richard Hassel. Uh, Mansa and I went to school together, and this is the sort of stuff that they might do today. So it's a much more sophisticated uh, application of, of very simplistic technology. It's just basically a secondary screen, a secondary roof over what might be a primary envelope uh, uh, control. I'd like to quickly go through these houses because it's not the main concern of this talk. So we see all these kinds of individual small house uh, approaches to developing uh, an environmentally responsive way of dealing with, with, with climate and the weather. Now, truth be told, this house is still largely air conditioned, but it has the, the capability to work as a, a naturally ventilated house. And of course, it's, 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 a, it's a super uh, expensive building. It's, it it you know, belongs in what is called the group class bungalow area, which is the posh area in Singapore. Just quickly go through the drawings. But you know, it's a very pretty house. Here is another one, another example. Now, this would be somebody who uh, might have been a student of mine. Um, uh, his, his practice is Chang Architects. Um, and it's a very beautiful house, uh, slightly over-designed, if you ask me, but pretty much kind of living in the open. But you can see all the kinds of strategies there. They're very similar. It's about a, a, a single cell room stretched out, arranged around a courtyard, using evaporative cooling because you have a pool, um, having large openings, having as much greenery as you can. Of course, that greenery becomes a bit of an issue because somebody really needs to maintain it. And of course, you have also have an, a problem with insects. But one of the, the, the most interesting things about this house is his use, not of these screens, but of this material. If you look closely, this is like a gabion wall, but the, the, it's not stone, it's actually coal, it's, it's charcoal. You know, like how people have charcoal in a, in a, a, as a, a form of filtration. So this wall actually breathes. And it's, it's a charcoal wall that breathes because the air goes through it. Uh, and um, how long it's going to last, I have no idea. He's, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I know, he's the only person who's ever done a, a charcoal wall. Um, so it's, it's basically a treated wood wall um, that allows that kind of penetration of air. Here we see the charcoal on, on its edge. Okay, But this house is basically, again, living in the open. 
And the, the issue for me with, with all these houses is that they're concerned pretty much with themselves because it's a very self-reflexive, inward-looking house. And if we look at the environment, just quickly going through the plans right now, um, I've circulated this to, to Jareen and Charlotte so she can share these plans with you. This is where I want to get to. Um, you can see the house in the middle there, um, next to this uh, pavilion with the octagonal roof. Um, and it's in a what is called a good class bungalow area, which is a posh neighborhood. So, you know, you don't worry about how you're going to work in the density of the urban environment. And for me, you know, that has to be the real kind of test of the pudding. If you're going to be doing tropical architecture, you have to look at how tropical architecture can survive uh, and sustain itself in the, in the modern city. Because it's very nice to do a posh person's house, but that can't be the solution for everyone. And this is part of the problem. So this is a, another uh, situation. This is in, in the Gold Coast. This is the Mervac building. This is where I worked and where I was head of school for a while. Um, this is, again, it's a single cell building with a sim simple corridor and a very large overhang. You can see the overhang is probably about, you know, one and a half times as, as, as deep as, as the room's in, uh, uh, depth in itself. Okay. And at the corner there, that's my office. And the beauty of it all was this was a self-sustaining building that won what would be the equivalent of Briam's highest award in, in Australia. It's called Green Star. So this was a six-star awarded building. Uh, you know, nat passive energy, natural ventilation, all that kind of stuff. But the problem is when you start to treat it like a, a, like a small house and you don't concern yourself with how the environment is going to be part and parcel of, of what you are uh, um, going to require, then you have a problem. And this is exactly what the problem is. So when I got there, we started the, uh, the architecture school building, which was designed by Peter Cook and Co. in what is Cook Robotum Architecture Bureau, CRAB, C-R-A-B. So, um, you can see the, the Mervac building and you can see the Peter Cook building. Uh, and for the life of me, I have no idea why they wanted to build this new building so close to, to the Mervac building. So effectively, you're creating something like this in between, which is about, you know, at best four meters apart. So in my office, I never had to switch on the air conditioning, although it was available. And as the building started to come up, you know, first story, second story. And then, you know, you find it, your natural ventilation, your cross ventilation died because there was no air pressure for you to have uh, a natural ventilation because the air pressure movement patterns were affected by this new building that started to create all these eddy currents that were in this space in between. So beautiful though that new building is, the Abidian School of Architecture, it's really a kind of, you know, <laughs> Uh, insensitive response to its neighbor. And it's not like there is, you know, a huge uh, problem with, with space. This is the, the situation in front of it. You know, all those columns were there to mimic all these trees and there's so much space. They could, and this is a university compound, they could have located it anywhere they wanted. There was no restriction about, you know, land title or uh, boundary or property. Well, this is just you know a case of really bad design. So this is um, uh, another project, and this takes us much more into the kind of public sphere. This is an Institute of Technical Education building by Tae King Soon, who was one of my mentors. Uh, and this is a very simple single cell building. Again, if you look at the diagram or the sectional drawing, is very simply understood. So secondary uh, brisole secondary brisole, not only primary, secondary brisole, that allows you to control the sun before you actually get to the, the main uh, training rooms. And from the floor plan, you can see how simple it is. Um, it's a simple single cell uh, arrangement and a lot of open space. But this gets us to the point where I'm trying to get to the talk, which is about how we deal with what we can refer to as the tropical 
city and architecture in the tropical city because that has to be the real kind of test case. And the beginnings of it were, were, were done by people like uh, Ken Yang, and this is one of his early buildings um, uh, that tried to deal with this issue. And you can see, if you look at it, there's nothing symmetrical about it because there's this rotational aspect about it that you can feel in, in this, uh, this design. And Ken's approach has largely been about you know, orientation, response to direction of wind, light, sun, and so forth. And we see the beginnings of this speculation in the work of both not only Ken, but also Taking Soon. And Taking Soon has been a very strong advocate for that tropical city idea. And the tropical city becomes something else because it's not just the one house, it's the city in itself. And I don't know if you've ever been to any of these tropical cities, you, you, you know, you'll find that air conditioning is such a, a, a prominent contributor, uh, but also a huge kind of energy uh, consuming sort of uh, aspect. Uh, and it's, it's a main problem. The history of, of, of the urban environments, particularly in Southeast Asia, and all these kind of very, very pretty now gentrified buildings, which actually had very humble beginnings. These were the typical kind of shop houses, and we see two or 300 years of uh, development here, or 250 years of development of, of the shop house. The shop house is a very strange prototype. The widths are about six meters from, from left to right for, for a particular terrace unit. The depth can be anywhere from about 25 to 30, sometimes even 40 meters deep. And how do you then sustain you know, ventilation, comfort and all that sort of stuff um, in a building that is you know, six meters by 40 meters deep. That becomes a bit of a problem. So just quickly going through all the historical styles, they're all basically just a development of the facade, just showing you the kind of you know, uh, development of the economy and how much money they had. Uh, but largely the building form in terms of its morphology is pretty much the same. And one of the strategies that they all share is to have this common footpath in the front, which is called the five foot way. So at the bottom of these shop houses, there was this five foot way, you know, however tall they were. And you can see how deep they were, but they all, had, they all shared this one very small courtyard. And that was the way it was. So in the history of it all, these, has been, these have been really, really difficult, you know, because they were about sometimes... 20 people living in, in one terrace unit. Um, and its history has been much more of slums than anything else for a very, very long time. These were photographs that I took somewhere in the mid 80s. You can see the modern building at the back by I am Pei. And you can see the dilapidated nature of, of uh, a section in, 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 in what is uh, Chinatown in Singapore. And these were the kinds of arrangements that they had. So then, you know, the, the real issue is how you deal with it. Because these were people who, who lived in, in times when there was no air conditioning. Now, of course, you gentrify it and it's all kind of pretty and it's all, you know, bars and whatnot, really high-end Michelin star restaurants and whatnot. But the, the reality of it all, this is the, the, the condition of urban living. That poverty was already recognized at the beginning in the 1850s. And this might be a typical kind of interior. Of course, there might be more people uh, than, than shown. Um, in the 1930s, there was a response to some of this in the clearance of the slums uh, and a response to developing a, a, a form of tropical housing, low rise uh, uh, social housing, so to speak. And this was the Singapore Improvement Trust. So this little kind of you know, art deco type housing were, uh, was. Uh, Develop, but would not develop in a, in a very large scale. Of course, today, famously, Singapore has that bottom edge photograph uh, of what is the housing development board uh, uh, success story, so to speak. Um, and it's largely based on, on the kind of vision at the top of, of Le Corbusier's uh, Plan Rossan. I remember uh, uh, there was a visitor who came and he spoke, uh, came to Singapore and he spoke to the, at the time, the head of the HDB. Uh, which is responsible for all this public housing. 
uh, the head of the HDB is, is uh, Liu Taiker. So this visiting professor just said, well, you know, Le Corbusier could never really achieve this in his lifetime, but you have. You know, he was just stroking up the ego of, of, of uh, Liu Taiker. And as, you know, he was stroking his ego, eventually he kind of dropped this clangor, which is, yeah, but do you like it? Because that's the problem, you know. Eventually all this housing still has a, 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 that kind of, you know, very strong cluster of, 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 of proximity that, that still has that kind of almost slum-like effect. It doesn't really have that, but it, the, the potential of it is, is there. And the, the evidence is, is in the pudding, you know. Singapore has never been able to successfully trans, transpose this, although they tried several times in India and in China. Because the form of governance that you require in order to make this sort of form of housing successful is very high. And that was not possible in, in parts of China and parts of India. So the, 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 it was not about form, but it was about social control that they actually made these forms of housing successful. So the modern tropical environment is um, a huge discussion or development that came up through the work of people like Ken Yang and also through uh, Tae Keng Soon. And here is uh, some of Ken Yang's studies of how he took these basic forms like the veranda, the courtyard, and he tried to kind of apply them and, and look at how they would work in the modern city. So we see the veranda as a technique. Uh, we see also the, the, this is a section of those, court, uh, sorry, of those uh, shop houses that I showed you, a very, very small courtyard, very deep buildings. Um, and then some of the traditional responses that he got from the vernacular uh, buildings of, of the various rural areas, including the kind of strategies that they have for sun shading and so forth. Um, then he tried to apply this to, to the city and tried to create a network of uh, what he called the tropical veranda city, where you can walk from one point of the city to another, completely under cover. And to some extent, I think he succeeded. I don't know if you've been to KL recently, but you can walk from one end to another. The part of the problem is uh, the, the people were, of course, you know, the problem. They, they created all these forms of walkway, this tropical veranda walkway. Eventually, they, they enclosed it and air conditioned it, which kind of killed the, the, the whole project, so to speak. You know? But nevertheless, at least they are able to walk from one point to another. Ken Yang's approach has been to look at how a building is like a valve that it takes the environment and then it allows what it wants to allow in and shuts the rest out. Um, and then it deals with it and then it, it functions like a, a, an operative valve. And this has been the strategy that he's applied to many of these multi-story buildings uh, in the city. So we see a section of one of his approaches and we see also a sketch of some of his uh, early ideas. And I think Ken is a, is a very early uh, strategist, uh, explorer, and designer. Taking soon, unfortunately, never really kind of dealt with multi-story buildings very much. Uh, so he's mostly dealt with the, uh, much more of the theory of the city and much more with smaller, smaller enterprise uh, uh, projects. But we see this current generation of, of architects who are dealing with some of these issues and trying to make uh, much of this come alive. So this is a project uh, by Woha Architects, again, uh, Wong Man Sam and Richard Hassel. And this is for a hotel in the city. You can see the, the shop houses, which are all gentrified lawyers' offices and restaurants and whatnot. Um, and then the multi-story building at the back, which is partially tropical. And the strategies that they use are effectively all these house strategies, which are then applied to a different kind of geometry in the multi-story situation. So here we see a top deck courtyard, basically, an open roof situation, double roof, multiple screens, open decks, uh, single cell buildings with uh, uh, natural ventilation, screens, and this to use a greenery to, to not only soften the edge, but also to freshen the air, uh, cooling, uh, using water to, to cool, uh, 
the air before it comes in. Open decks, this is, a, is I think on the six or eight story. Um, very open environments, naturally ventilated. And then having an open roof deck, again with these multiple screens, a little bit overdone if you ask me, a bit industrial, but nevertheless, the, 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 the idea is there, the attempt is, is, is to, to screen it all, uh, to screen off the, the, the heat and the light before it gets down to the deck. And then finally, this project, which I'd like to end on, um, this is a project in, in also in Singapore. This is Moonin Rice, not a very well-known project, but this describes largely the kind of um, enterprise or the approach that is possible. So on the, with the plan, you can see it's a single cell building, again, you know, with a simple corridor like that. And this corridor is, you know, you can open it at either end, so you will ventilate very easily. It's not a particularly deep building. And it uses these stratagems that are, that are again, derived from the vernacular, the screens, the various forms of, of uh, control of ventilation. And the most innovative bit, which is actually, you know, the architects, uh, uh, claim that this was from, from somewhere in, in Sarawak, one of the vernacular houses that they saw, what is called a kind of Dyak window, D-Y-A-K. Um, and this is, a, a, if, you, if you look at the, at the window, it's, it's a, a glass and then it has this horizontal section, which is where you would get the ventilation from. And I'll show you some of the drawings so it makes a bit more sense. And they call this, the architects call this the monsoon window because you would get driving rain and you would get uh, actually also, also driving wind. And forgive me, I'm just going to quickly scroll so I can find the, the drawings here. So you see a very small uh, rendering here. Uh, on the left, you can see the monsoon window. Um, and basically, it ventilates through the horizontal section, and the vertical sections are screens. And it allows the building then to ventilate through this single cell arrangement and still preserve a, a, a tropical form of design. Okay, let me just yeah, come to that. There you go, that's the detail. The next series of, of images are basically just slides of, of this building, and this is where I will end the talk and ask if there are any questions. I'm happy to kind of open it as a discussion. I know it's been a short talk with a lot of images, but uh, it's a very simple form of, of uh, design in, in, in terms of taking very vernacular strategies and applying them in, in much more modern geometries. And it's a very comfortable building. Now, part of the other problem is, is that people need to dry their clothes and they want to dry their clothes, but they want to dry their clothes and not have um, clothes hanging out of the building, particularly if it's a you know, multi-story building um, and, and have some form of control. So th there's a system here, which the architects have designed that allows for that. And then your kind of typical passive cooling uh, strategy. So at the background, you can see that this is exactly what the, 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 the real kind of si uh, situation or scenario is. It's, it's a dense tropical city. You know, the question is how do you then deal with this uh, strategy? Um, and, and how there is maybe a way in which architecture and all that kind of concrete jungle plugs it back 
to the point where you would have uh, what would be a much more naturalistic uh, ecology. When I was a boy, there was much more greenery in the area. And in the morning, if I ran out to the gate to fetch the newspapers from my granddad, you know, it would be slightly wet and moist because you would have dew. Today, there's hardly any kind of dew point in Singapore because of all the concrete. And that's part of the kind of issue. But buildings like this will allow that kind of greenery to come back. It will allow the kind of ventilation to come back. And creating all these kind of green lungs around the city allows for that city to be still at the same time dense, but uh, somehow uh, responsive to, to, to the current climatic issues. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll end there and take some questions if I, if I can. Great, thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, I, I hope it was useful. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I, I personally, I lived in Hong Kong for a while. Um, so where everything is air conditioned and I find, yes. uh, I find air conditioning, I never really got used to it in the time I was there. I was always, you know, you're, you're freezing inside the building and then you leave and it's absolutely ridiculous. No, it, 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 is, it is bizarre. You go to work in those places and even in Singapore, people go to work and they, and they, they wear a, a jumper indoors. That's because it's so do. cold. Yeah. It's so cold. It's ridiculous. It's exactly what I used to do. I used to take jumpers to the office and leave them there, but and then obviously take them off to go home. So, um, yeah, so that's effectively the problem, you see. So how do you then design all these you know, modern spaces that, that can have natural ventilation and that allows you to kind of come to grips with modern working, modern living, without have, being this you know, uh, consumer of energy? Um, uh, in this particular environment. And it's such a, a lovely natural environment that people uh, don't really appreciate half the time because they are fighting it by, with all these artificial strategies. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, open the floor up, as it were. Does anybody have any questions? You're welcome to either put them in the chat or unmute yourself and um, ask the questions. I have a question. Okay. Um, hey, hi. hi, Raymond. One, thank you for that. It was really interesting. Um, and I think this whole sort of sits within our lots of lecture series about sort of sustainable materials. And obviously, we're quite mindful that we don't live in a tropical environment. I think what you were talking about are these sort of very vernacular ideas that lend itself to all different styles of architecture. In your opinion, is there anything that perhaps we can do, let's say, with the Norfolk, with the UK? that, you know, from the lessons that you've learned from tropical architecture that we could implement in our own architecture? Yeah, I, I, think, I think part of what we do in architecture school sometimes is a bit problematic that we, 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 we teach people how to do things that are, I suppose, fashionable um, or applauded somewhere else. And then we forget the kind of you know, almost very native strategies that are before us. So I remember, um, I know you had a talk from Anthony about Kobash, um, and, and that's you know, if effectively it. You know, how, how many people actually know about it and want to deal with it? It's just it's naturally occurring material or strategy that, that, that is there. Uh, that is somehow kind of forgotten because then you you know people people want to do the kind of Zaha and Dan and Lipskin and Frank Gehry type of thing and then you know, that there is a, a, a very strong lesson or a series of strong lessons that we can learn from the vernacular because they've been doing it for millennia, you know. <laughs> and it's, it's transforming it. You know, Charles Korea used to give only one lecture through his, his, his very illustrative uh, career. And the, the, I've been to this lecture a few times. It's always the same thing. And it, it, the title is always the same. It's Transfer and Transformation in Modern Architecture to India. So for him, it was how you, you take the, the vernacular strategy, you transfer and transform it into a kind of modern strategy. Um, and there, there are many, many things that we, we, we can learn from how we deal with uh, uh, building envelopes, discarding rain, snow, whatever, you know, preserving heat and so forth. So I think that, that there's a lot to learn from vernacular architecture. Thank you. Cheers, Raymond. Thanks. It was really Thanks interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the question.
Any any other questions out there? Anybody want to uh, unmute themselves or ask Roman a question? No one else? Okay, I don't know if there are any more questions actually, Roman. Uh, <laughs> everyone's still thinking about it, taking it all in, I think. Yeah, take it all in. <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah. I think that was really interesting. And I think what you're saying about vernacular, we were talking about that in another conversation about the use of traditional materials um, coming back. You know, I work a lot in conservation, so we use a lot of traditional material, you know, lime, um, mortar, lime render, timber and things. But I think some of those are kind of making, um, becoming a little bit more commonplace, um, thinking about climate change and thinking about the vernacular. So. I think it yeah. is becoming, you know, more of a conversation about that. Yeah, in, in, in so far as, as, as tropical architecture is concerned, there, there is um, uh, a series of lessons that people are learning about, not only the, the, the you know, climatic stratagems, but, but also in, in terms of material longevity, mm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, how you can actually... Um, Recycle, upcycle, or, or 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 use natural material in 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 a in a much more productive way. Because I think for the longest time, many of these territories were suffering from a kind of mimicry architecture. You know, they they might do a a, a roof that is very typical of an Indonesian roof that 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 is that kind of shape, but they do it in concrete. You know, and then in order to do it in concrete, you have to build the, the formwork first yeah. of all in that shape, and then the formwork is actually your roof already. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which you which would have worked as a roof if you just clad it correctly. You know, um, yeah. so there's that kind of argument about you know of of the kind of pointlessness in construction sometimes. Yeah, we have just had a question come in actually from James. I don't know if he wants to unmute himself or he's happy for me to read it. Um, but he has asked, uh, he said, there's a lot of planting in modern buildings, particularly high rise. How do yeah. people deal with the requirement for water and irrigation of the planting, especially in arid regions? That is a brilliant question because actually there was another project which I didn't show. Um, and I, I uh, showed it to the students not long ago and it's a project by um, Heather Wicks. Uh, it's also meant for Singapore. I think the jury is out in, in, with regards to all that kind of planting. Uh, the problem with the maintenance of all this kind of planting is in your, your uh, uh, fees that you pay as a, as a resident. You know, somebody is a gardener or a gardening company that comes and cleans your windows and does your, your plant maintenance. But part of the other problem is in, in these multi-story buildings, if you, don't, if you treat it as a kind of symmetrical uh, entity, uh, all around, then you you will have a problem. If you look at Ken Yang's buildings, he wraps his his plants around certain areas. But if you just treat it as a kind of geometrical issue, which is what Heatherwicks did, uh, it will never survive because the heat that builds up uh, in the afternoon in in those walls, uh, some of those plants will be subject to temperatures of about sixty five degrees centigrade. Uh, and, and they will wither and they will die. So the maintenance, you can probably maintain it, but you know, uh, it will be a high maintenance cost. Somebody will have to kind of replace these plants and, you know, and all that. So right now, I think that the, uh, as much as we have this kind of problem with greenwashing, in the tropics, you have all these people who are designing buildings and then they wrap it with plants and they stuff plants all over any, any nook and cranny where you can get any kind of greenery, they'll stuff some plants. And they think, you know, it's like how people do a render and they put people in cars, you know, you just stuff plants in the, in the building. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's the wrong thing to do because it's all about orientation. It's all about, you know, how these plants are going to get water, how uh, they are also creating insects. So there is a, 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 a and I did show these slides of, of the Chinese project in China where they, in, in South China, so it's subtropical. And, and, you know, they have all these massive Chinese products where they can't sell. So there's no occupants. So this was like a, a kind of ghost condominium, you know, uh, scenario. There were probably about, you know, I don't know, 60 families in, in the housing that would have about 600 houses, uh, flats, okay? 
so it was largely unoccupied, which means largely unmaintained. So, you know, then you had all these kind of insect problems. There were massive, massive insect problems because of the, the, the plants. Uh, and, you know, there was nobody in these houses to, to maintain these plants. And that was just, you know, horrendous. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not making this up. You can look this up. This is, actually exists in China. It's, it's a massive, massive problem. Mm. So right now, I think there are a lot of these buildings and, 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 and that have plants, but these are hotels. So they have a maintenance crew day in, day out. But if it was, you know, a, a private housing development and you don't actually have the ability to maintain it, uh, it's the same problem as, as if you have a front garden in a, in a, in a suburban housing estate. You know, you have the houses that have these very manicured gardens and then you go to another part of the estate and it's completely, you know, something else. Mm. It requires quite a lot of maintenance. It's not easy. Yeah. And I, I really, really think it's, it's a bad idea that people are doing as much of this kind of what I call greenwashing. Mm. So thanks for the question, James. Yeah, thank you, James. Anybody else? Any questions at all? James said that was interesting. Thank you. He doesn't want to doesn't want to talk himself. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, if we have no other questions, it just leaves me to thank Raymond for tonight's fascinating talk. That was really great. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, as you said at the beginning, that was the third one in our lecture series. We've got one more talk lined up at the moment next week, which is um, materials in a passive house world. Um, same, same time, same place, next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Um, so I hope some of you will be able to join us for that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you have any further questions, you can simply email me at, at, at uh, NUA. Yeah, absolutely. Do do get in touch if anyone has any further questions. And we'll be sending, we'll be putting the recording on YouTube, um, on our new YouTube channel, and we'll send out um, a link to everybody for that. So you'll be able to watch it again. Okay, take care all. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much, Roman. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.